Hello, God bless you. Welcome to the Well After Hours. I'm your host, Beverly Allen, and I am so happy today to be able to welcome my special guest to the well today, pastors Pablo and Erica Pizarro. Pizarro, who are Pastor Pablo is the senior pastor of Lighthouse Assemblies of God Church in Newark on 291 Park Avenue, correct, Pastor? I am so glad, Aaron and his beautiful wife, Erica, I'm so happy to have this team, this power team with us today as we give a presentation on, we were going to talk about the pastor as Christ's frontline essential worker. And Pastor, I'm using you as a representative for, for many pastors today because of all that you're doing and knowing your passion, you know, and your perseverance and endurance. And you're coming up on, this is 10 years as I spoke to you. You all have been in this ministry for 10 years. You know, 10 is the number of testing and responsibility. That means you made it. You made it. You made it to 10 years. It's going to be a cakewalk for the next 10 because you did it through the hardest ones. Thank God. I mean, that that's real testing. And you and you've come out responsibly and faithful. And that's that's the main thing. You know, I know it's not easy. Yeah. And being married to a pastor and being a pastor's wife, I know it's not easy. And um, and in this day and time, we started. We thought it was rough. It's even it's it's more challenging now than ever before. But you know what? The harder the challenge, the more grace and the more God empowers. <laughs> and I'm sure you will agree. <laughs> and and from what I've seen of you, I can't wait for the viewers just to hear from you. And I'm gonna, before we get started, I just wanna read a little bit of your bio so that they understand who we're so blessed to have. Um, Pastor Pablo Pizarro is married to his beautiful wife, Erica, for 22 years. And they have two children, a daughter, Savannah, and a son, Zach, who is 19 years old. And currently, Pastor Pablo is the lead pastor of Lighthouse Assembly of God in Newark, New Jersey. And he has served as a Newark police chaplain for 16 years. He is currently on the board, a board member of My Brother's Keeper in Newark, New Jersey, and is an advocate for justice and mercy within our community. Currently, Pastor Pablo has ventured into adopting local schools and bridging that gap between the community, the teacher, and the students. And as he states, schools and their staff need a chaplain too. I love that. <laughs> he also serves the City of Newark Civilian Complaint Review Board. He is also a coordinator of the Newark Ward Interfaith Clergy Alliance of Newark. He is also a regional representative for the New Jersey Coalition of Latino Pastors and Ministers. Wow, you are a busy, busy man <laughs> doing, doing the work of the Lord. This is amazing how God is just using you. And I, I have to say this, from start, your core value has been love Christ, serve people, and touching lives. You don't get a better start than that. And when that's in your heart to do, that is just amazing. And so I'm just thankful. And I know we have many questions that I would really like to ask you, but I want to start with, because when you sent me your bio, I read it, um, how you really began this. I mean, because you're a young, you're a young pastor. I mean, you're, you, 10 years, <laughs> I'm sure it could almost double. They say it's not the years, it's the mileage <laughs> that you've done so much. And I'm going to get to all of that. But, you know, um, as a young pastor, you started out, and I spoke to Erica, Erica, I said, that when you met him, he was not a pastor. <laughs> he was in the church, he was working as you both were, but he began to become a, a minister. And... Um, I'm going to let you guys take the story away. First, Pastor Pablo, you were eight years old. And I want to start from when you were a youth uh, and you were with your grandmother and you were in the church then because that's an amazing, you see the hand of God in that. So I just want you to tell the viewers that part of your, you know, your testimony, your journey. Well, first, let me start by saying thank you for having us on your program. Uh, for me, it's such a blessing to be here. 
I'm honored and I'm thankful for you, Evangelist. So thank you for being a, a, a tool in, 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 in the body of Christ. So thank you so much for this and the opportunity that you would allow us to share our story. Because the Bible does tell us that at the end, the only way we overcome is by the power of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And so Absolutely. we believe that our testimony is what's going to propel others to say, hey, if you did it with them, you could do it with us. Right? Amen. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're thankful for that. But to answer your question, yes, uh, you know, my, my uh, uh, I discovered my purpose at an early age. Uh, and, and those that are traveling through life need to understand that we all have a mission. God has placed us here on a purpose. Some discover it earlier than others. Uh, but we must discover it because God placed us here for a reason. And then when, when we're done, that's when we expire. So, you know, a lot of people are worried right now about coronavirus. And if I'm going to die, you ain't going to die until you finish your purpose here on earth. <laughs> amen. 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 <laughs> so that, that's um, my purpose. You know, I discovered it early in life and, and, you know, I didn't know that, but I was eight years old and, um, my mother and my father dropped me off to my grandmother's house in the Bronx, New York. We were raised in the projects of 1420 Bronx River Avenue in the projects of uh, Bronx, New York, a very, very poor uh, location, inner city. Um, you know, those projects are still there. And when we were dropped off, we were dropped off not for uh, one night babysitting services that my grandmother was going to provide. Uh, my, when I say we, I am the middle of two, ch uh, uh, three, uh, of three children. I'm the middle. My, my sister is the eldest and my brother is the youngest. So I'm the middle child. And they dropped all three of us off to grandma's house uh, because my father and my mother just wanted to go to uh, lower Manhattan on the Times Square section and just go sell drugs and go live and uh, live a world like they didn't have children. Uh, and so, you know, we saw growing up a world of drug addiction, alcoholism. Uh, my father and my mother, when they would get high, uh, there would be lots of fights, domestic violence. I, I saw my uh, father take a fork to my mother's ear, blow her eardrums out. I saw him take a, a bat and hit her to her left knee, shatter her knee. I seen him put her head through a refrigerator door and blow it open, her back head, uh, blood all over all the time alcohol, after parties, I would take those cans and change them in the morning because we didn't have anything to eat. Uh, this was all in the projects. And then one day they just dropped us off. And, um, you know, I, I, I could say that uh, there was no priest, no pastor, no uh, college degree, none of that in our family. It was just pandemonium. And I remember that at eight years old, when they dropped us off to my grandmother's house, my sister was born premature to uh because she was my mom would abuse crack and cocaine uh with her in her belly and then my brother was born premature addicted to crack in the, in the late 80s 84 uh he was a crack baby so he was born uh only six pounds and he had uh patches in his eyes and was hooked onto a machine I, that i can remember and i was only like four or five years old uh and so uh, you may ask, what happened with you? You know, what, why, you know, were you born a crack baby? I wasn't. And so behind me, I always have this, but nobody knows. I do a lot of Zoom and I do a lot of online ministry now. Obviously, everybody's doing it, but I do it from here. This is my office. And behind me right here, you're going to see Jeremiah 1 and 5 and says, you were born set apart. And that is my verse that applies to my life because my mom, when she was pregnant of me, fell in jail for nine months. She couldn't use drugs. She couldn't use alcohol. So I came out not a preemie and not that, you know, my, bro my brother and my sister weren't picked, but God had me handpicked for such a time as this, as Jeremiah 1 and 5, to preach the gospel. He set me aside unto the nations. And so at eight years old, when, um, and, and mind you, and, and this is going to be, and we we'll could talk about this later, this all will be in my book that is coming out July. And uh, so uh, I, I remember that, um, my mother telling me, that, you know, so she, my, my sister is a premature baby uh, and my brother was, I wasn't. But prior to us three, um, she lost 13 children, 13 children, because when they would get high and she was pregnant or whatever, there was no protection there. He would beat her. They were abusing drugs. She was reckless. 
And so she was losing all these kids. And mind you, there's more to it, but, you know, she had messed up ovaries because her father raped her when she was only eight years old. So this was the reason why she was using drugs. This was the reason why she was trying to numb her life. Um, nobody believed her. They placed her in a home. Um, and then she met my father after she gave, came out of that foster home. So uh, all this to say that they dropped us off and they left us. And one day my grandmother at home said, I can't raise you guys anymore. I'm old. Um, I can't do this. You know, I, I, I already raised my children and they all turned out evil. And she was upset. I remember that day. And she sent us to church in a uh, church bus. At the time, the church van would go pick you up. And at the projects, I remember it was a blue and white van. They came, picked us up. She didn't go to church that day, but it was a prayer service during the week. And that's why as a pastor, I wholeheartedly believe in prayer service because of what happened to me that night. The pastor of the church said, is there anybody here who has a, a, a prayer request? And everybody was raising their hands. And a bunch of, there was mothers of the church. We call them the mothers. They were elderly mm -hmm. ladies. And, um, you know, I raised my hand and, and I said, I do. I have a prayer. I said, if God is real, I need him to heal my mom and my dad from drug and alcohol addiction. And a lot of them, they were exactly what you were doing. They just put a face and they felt bad. And I wasn't looking for pity. I just wanted, I wanted a home. I wanted mom and dad. And they began to pray. But the reason why we were praying with urgency that night in the church in the Bronx, New York, on Gleason Avenue, it was a Church of God church. Uh, because uh, the next day, my, my grandmother had set for an appointment to take us to foster home. So you can see the cycle. My mother was in a foster home. Now my, my grandmother was about to put us in a foster home because she couldn't take care of us. So, uh, you know, when I got home, my grandmother was crying. And she says, I, I just can't. I have to cancel the appointment to take you guys to the foster home. I looked up to the heavens. I looked up to, I said, I cannot believe that God heard an eight-year-old boy's prayer. I couldn't believe it. But what I did that that night is that I prayed to God in the church and I said, God, if you allow me not to go to a foster home and you save my mother and my father, I promised at eight years old, I promise you that I will tell everybody about who you are. I don't know what I was saying. All I know is that I promised him that I will tell everybody about who he is. Fast forward to not make this interview long. Um, that's what I'm doing today. That's why I do what I do. That's why I take a different approach than many um, you see me, if anybody knows me, I'm on the streets. My office technically is here in my church. You won't see all my uh, plaques and none of that. I don't care for that. Uh, my office is in the streets. Um, I promised God that I would do what um, I said I would do. So I'm still fulfilling that. And I, I don't want to be too long winded, but my mom has been oh, for 22 years. He saved her. My dad came to the Lord and God fulfilled the prayer of an eight-year-old boy. And um, you know what? That generational curse of drugs and alcohol stopped with me. Uh, my children, my wife, we don't know what that is. Uh, the premature sister and brother who they said they will never go to college or, I mean, they weren't special at all their lives. They had a lot of challenges because of my mom's drug abuse. I could tell you that my sister graduated high school. She went to culinary arts school. She got married. She never wanted kids. She got a kid. My brother, he's, he still got challenges, but I'm going to tell you right now, he went to college when nobody thought he was mute to seven years old. He couldn't speak without any uh, occupational therapy, without any speech therapy. He spoke. The Lord healed him. An evangelist laid hands on him and healed him. So I am a living witness that Christ is real, that he still heals, that he still saves and so I'm on a mission. I discovered my mission then that I have to go and preach the gospel to all mankind and that he's real. And so the people that God is bringing to Lighthouse in Newark, New Jersey, Newark, if you know anything about Newark, it's a rough city, 288,000 people, primarily black, American, and Latino. We are suffering the most that are suffering from this coronavirus. We are, our state is leading uh, our, our second in the country, our city is uh, second in the country. And our zip code, where our church is at, is number one in the city. So we're in the middle of the hotbed, and yet we're still out there. We're putting on our mask. We're putting on gloves. We're giving out food. We're preaching Jesus because I promised at eight. So that's it. That's all in the nutshell. No. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my. Listen, this is your interview. <laughs> I'm not cutting you off. I want to hear it all. That is absolutely Awesome. I mean, we, we know, we know the scriptures. God declares the end of a thing from the beginning. 
He yeah. knew I was going to turn out. And just when you see the divine providence of God, even in your life, as you were speaking, you know, about the time frame, about your mother being in jail so she couldn't have drugs. And that's when you were born. That was all orchestrated. That was divine orchestration. You can't even write a script like that. Yeah. You just Our can't even write a script. Right like that. Yeah. That yeah. is awesome. And, and if, if, if anything, if you ever have a, a trying day or, or, or a, a seemingly dark day, you can recall that and know, you know, it's something when you know God's hand was on your life, you know that's that right. he, this was his divine plan for you to be who you are, you know. And that's another thing. You've been um, at the, how you even came to pastor because you came out of what was it, Temple Rock? Um, Temple Rock. Yes. Temple Rock. Still my and, church. Yes. And so how, how he God's orchestration from there to Lighthouse. Yeah. How, yeah, what, so, what were those steps? Well, um, I have to take you a little bit back. So when the Lord saves my mom and, and the Lord saves uh, my, my dad and, you know, my dad passed away uh, of a heart failure. Um, and so uh, I quickly at 17 and a half, almost 18 years, I got married young. That's why a lot of people say, I've been married 22 years. And they're like, well, I haven't even broke 40. I break 40 this year. And oh, so, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's a saying. They say Latinos get married young. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> then when your children get grown, you're still the young. Look at you two. You still, still look like newlyweds. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and so at 17 and a half, uh, my mother had to come from her, her, the streets. She had a black eye in our wedding. She was in drugs. She was a fiend. She signed away in my marriage license so I can get married. Uh, young lady here swept me off my feet really quick, you know, because remember, at, after that age, I, I started to tell, I, I went to women's prisons. Uh, I went to regular prisons at eight, uh, I was really, no, like 16, 15 years old. I was preaching, just telling about how God saved at least my mom and my dad. And so, I was, you know, she met me preaching. You know, I, I went to her mother's church and I was preaching in a, they, it was a little basement church and she was the visitor. She was not even a Christian. They invited her to go see a young preacher. And, um, and so <laughs> I went there and, you know, her sister brought her there and um, her sister had a common friend, my best friend. And so we were there, you know, and we met each other and, you know, she laid eyes on me and she let me go uh -huh. from then. <laughs> So that's how that started. That's how I knew he referred to the I'll, I'll get Erica's. I'll get Erica's take on that in a little bit. Everybody always says that, <laughs> but it's the truth. She pursued me. <laughs> oh, you know what? That's a good thing. She saw something great, and oh, and God put it in her heart. And it's yeah. amazing because. That day, if she didn't miss church that day, she would have missed you. And this is what I'm saying, how God puts people together. She was handpicked for you. She had to be there that day. You know, somebody had to tell her. I was a fill-in preacher. I covered from my friend who's a pastor today in Florida. He was supposed to go preach, and he called me. He said, can you, can you go out and make, I can't go to this church. I said, all right, I'll do it for you, buddy. I always used to do that. And if I had not gone there that day, my steps are ordained. God had something for me. <laughs> I, didn't he? Didn't he? My goodness! <laughs> I'm, I'm blessed. Every I'm every good. young preacher would love to have a beautiful wife, you know, by his side, and you really were blessed, highly favored. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a blessed man. So That's awesome. Now we have two beautiful children. Uh, my my daughter, who is uh, going to be 22 this year. Uh, she's, uh, I can't believe you two have 20 adult children that old. It, it's just yeah. almost, it's incredible. Like, <laughs> my only child is, is, is my dog, Wally. He, yeah, he's my baby. He's our baby. That's her baby more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're thankful at the season in life in which we, in, we are in. Um, and, and, and so when we got married, uh, we quickly, I was, I was a little depressed because my father died and you know, let, let you know. I have to be real. You'll read that in my book, but um, you know, I, I want I want to be transparent with your viewers. There are going to be times that you know you'll see the finished product now, but you don't know what I had to go through in order to uh, come or travail, uh, or, 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 or how did I make it here? Right? You're just you're just seeing the finished product, uh, but there came a time right after the Lord saved my parents. 
you know, the Lord saw a fit and he took my father suddenly, a heart attack, and went to the hospital for an appointment, passed out there and died. And he was my hero. He was everything to me, even though he, you know, um, you know, he changed. And I saw a changed man and when he gave his heart to the Lord. He would go with me to different preaching. He was like my booking manager. This guy, I mean, I would fly with me everywhere. He was amazing after he gave his heart to the Lord. And he really showed that you could redeem yourself, that you could make your, you know, your your wrongs right. And so, uh, you know, all of a sudden, abruptly, he just passes away. And, um, you know, some of the things that you start thinking, the what ifs, the regrets, he didn't get to see his grandchildren, um, you know, because she was just, she just had been pregnant that year. So he passed away in 98. And wow. I was upset. And those were the three darkest years of my life because after I promised God that I would do something, I retreated. I didn't backslide like, you know, just, you know, went crazy, but I, you know, I, I didn't want to know about church. I fell into deep depression and I left New York and I, and I went and I ran to Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I, nobody knew me in New Jersey, but I was like Jonah running from God. You know, and the storm will follow you. And people will be like, you're the reason, right? So I try to go to clubs. I, I want the young people listening to me. I, I tried it. And even when we tried it, there will be shootouts and stuff. They're almost like God saying, you don't belong here. here. And he spared my life. And so those were the darkest days of my life. That was not for me. My wife didn't meet me that way. She was like, what are you doing? I was just upset with the Lord. I felt that the Lord took my father from me prematurely. Um, and so one day... I was with my brother, the premature brother. I, you know, I just like to be with him. So I said, come on, let's take a drive. I picked him up and I was driving. I wasn't feeling that I wasn't, you know, in my right mind. I wasn't sober minded. Okay. I was just, you know, driving around and it was a Saturday night and I don't know what happened. I got lost. I wasn't too familiar with the area. I just moved to Newark and I saw a church that said Assemblies of God. I've always been Assemblies of God, a church of God. And I saw a church and I started to cry because I know my roots, what the Bible says, if you train up a child in his way, even when they're old, they won't depart from it, right? And so I just stopped in front of the church on a Saturday night. Usually they're not open. I yanked the door, but it wasn't open. So I said, ah, you know, I was like, I just need God. I was, I was running from him. And um, from there, I got back into the car and I hear somebody, oh, oh, yell. And I'm like, what happened? And it was the pastor of the church. He opened it. Did you took that door? Did you tug on that door? I said, oh, yeah, I did. And when he says, well, um, how can I help you? I said, no, nah, I just want when the church was open. He said, no, tomorrow we're open on Sunday school, and you can come tomorrow. You know, I was like, oh, okay. He goes, I'm cleaning tonight. And then he just stops and stares at me and looks at me and prophetically starts to speak. He says, you're running from God because you lost somebody very important in, in your life. You can't run from God. The Lord says, I've got a plan for you. And then he points out the altar, very big church. He said, you see that altar? I have chosen you to be on there. And I said, oh. whatever I was feeling that night, I went home, right? <laughs> I went home. We weren't going to church. I said, pack the kids up tomorrow. And we're going to church. And from there, we went to church. And um, that, we didn't look back. I started going back again. I, I, you know, I, got, uh, I went to the Bible Institute and started studying and seminary and all that good stuff. And, um, and, and, uh, I got, I got uh, to be a youth pastor there. And then uh, within the studying, one of my teachers, I became close to him and, uh, you know, the Lord transitioned us there. And that was the pastor of Temple Rock. We transitioned there. And one of the things that I know, like you just said earlier, the Lord uh, ordained my steps because he brought me there to, you know, I remember I lost my dad when I was 16 years old, almost 17. Yeah. And so I, I'm a kid now with no experience, no father, but I'm a father, you know, to two children, you know. And so I was very young. At 19, I had two kids. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm there. And my pastor to this day, is, he's, my, he's my father. He's my mentor. He taught me two words that took me far. He says, remember always to say I love you and I'm sorry to your wife and to your kids. And that has taken me to put my pride aside. I was raised that. In my house, it was domestic violence, and you slap a woman, and you go up top. But not this man. This man taught me what it was to love the altar, to respect and revere the house of God, to take ministry serious, to be a man of your word, to be a person of integrity, to serve when no one is looking. Um, I could keep going. That man taught me that. I speak to him almost every day, spoke to him today. I call, And I've been pastoring 10 years. This is the man that ordained me. The man that when my car broke down, gave me his car with the D or you can take it. He's not, you know, and th this is a man that um, he's, he's been tremendous in my life. 
And um, he's part of it. He'll always be part of my life. Uh, and he was there to see the 10th year anniversary. And one day, we were we were in church serving. I, I, I was the youngest vice chairman of the church at the time. You know, he was using me in different areas. We just purchased a new building. He, he had me run with that project, the Temple Rock Community Center there. And, you know, he would put a lot of weight on me. And I remember that one day he woke up and he said, I got to speak to you. I said, what's up? He said, the Lord told me I have to give up my Isaac. And I said, what? He says, um, he was a presbyter at the time, uh, which means he oversees other churches. He said, the Lord said, I got to give you up. He said, give me up? <laughs> Why? What? Are you, give me up where? He said, I got to <laughs> you into a church that's dying. that needs to be revitalized. And uh, that is Lighthouse today. And we, I mean, my wife, we were sad. I mean, well, she was, it was a hard moment, man. And she was like, oh, heck no, you know, you know, not yet. You know, we knew that I had that calling, but it was, I was only Give me some prep time, right, Erica? <laughs> I, well, how did you feel, Erica? Because it's not like he, when he's called, you're called along with him. Everything he goes through, you're going to go through. How did, you, how did that hit you? Right, well nervous and you know afraid and what was our next step so i was i wasn't sure how it was going to look you know i wasn't sure so but god has never left us to this day he hasn't forsaken us so it's been okay you all must have had a real conversation that night oh my goodness oh, yeah. <laughs> yes you did yeah what, one of the things pastor taught us right uh was that i can never go green light with something if she wasn't on board Correct. So we couldn't call him back until we knew that she was like, okay, let's do this. Yeah. On board. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a very scary moment. We, we And then that has taught us because we've been through similar situations where we're about to make uh, choices in our lives. We feel that, that, like that, you know, we were like, it was so uncertain. But then, you know, when you can, you have the green light, when you have a peace and there's a peace then you say, okay. I feel the peace of God. Let's let's move with this, or we can move. Almost like when we were going to move twice, when we were going to move from our building, when we got into the new building. She's taught me this, you know. Tell her what you do, even when we moved into the house. Well, he, pray, and then I start um, getting boxes. She started start packing. packing by faith. <laughs> One day I see her packing boxes. I'm like, "What are you doing? This is a woman, right? She don't speak much." But she's a woman of action and faith. I was going to say, her, her action are her words. Her action is her words. Isn't she, she leads us. I, I couldn't believe that. When we, we, wanted a, we wanted a house. And it's the same year that we moved from, our, we were renting from a Presbyterian church. And we wanted our own building for so long. And it was the same year that we wanted, she's, she's been, we want to be in the house. We want to be in the house. We want to be in the house. And one day I got home and she's packing and the boxes said my name on it. Others said her. And like, it was like, we were moving. I'm like, we had no lease. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't search anything. I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, what, what is that? I'm got, we're going to move. We're going to start looking for a house. We didn't search, you know? So, so she moved by action. Her. And the same year, she did the same thing. She said, let's get up. We, we were doing, we do this every year. We do prayer walks. We walk around the community and we just pray. So she was like, well, let's go looking for our new building. And that day she said that we found our new building. So you got to listen to your wives, men of God. <laughs> <laughs> Because God is speaking to them. <laughs> While you're taking care of one side of the business, she's taking care of the other. Well, that's Proverbs 31. Yes. You know, while the man is about his business, she's out there giving me a good name. Oh, and yes. And, and hustling and bustling and making it happen. <laughs> Isn't that something? It, Erica, when, when, when the Lord put it in your heart, that moment that you really like got on board and you felt like that was God, you knew that that was what God was calling you to do. You couldn't say it like you said, the house, maybe you didn't see it, but it was in your spirit, right? Your yes, definitely, yes. I mean, we spoke about it. And of course, then I was like, I agree. If God said it, then we have to do it. And so I was just my answer and we went ahead. End of story, right? It's like, that's it, we're going. That is so awesome. That that's is really we awesome. When we transitioned over to be pastors, that's how we did it. And when we look back now, I think I probably sent you that video. It's the 10th year anniversary. When we look back, we're like, wow, we really went through all that. And it seems like yesterday, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite yesterday. Maybe a week ago, a month ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's all part of the journey. <laughs> oh boy. If, if, if you, if you don't go through those things, you know, looking back in hindsight, <laughs> it, it oh, looks yeah. like, okay, that wasn't so bad, but when you're going through it, <laughs> oh, yeah. it it's a, it's another motion, you know, but God uses it, strengthens you. Uh, prepares you the more builds up your faith you know you can't have good without bad otherwise how would you be able to distinguish between the two you can't mm. have health without sickness you you know the opposites you know prove one another you know and god shows his hand in all of it and uh yeah oh yeah 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 and he handpicked your wife <laughs> he handpicked your wife that's a blessing Ooh. What a blessing. Because yeah, we, we're like the yin and the yang, right? Because I'm the one that's always like, oh, 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 we got to do this. We gotta. She's like, calm down. And I'm, and she, brings, <laughs> she brings that balance. And, the, and then, you know, that's how our children are. They really mirror us. You know, we, my, my son and my, my daughter, you got to see them. It's just like, I'm like, oh, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, and they're involved in ministry with you all, too, which is, which is such a testament, too. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, my daughter... She leads, helps lead worship. She does the best she could, and she loves to sing. She loves to worship. Um, just, I think it was yesterday, she put up a, devo a devotion on our church page. I was blessed. I was like, oh, my goodness, she's just growing in the Lord. And then my son, he helps since he was, since he was like eight, nine years old, um, he's been working with sound, and he loves anything that has to do with the technology aspect of it. He makes it work. He's you know, any, any problem I have here, I'll just call him. He makes it work. <laughs> and and uh, Erica, you teach. You you teach, right? Yeah. Er, Erica teaches, right? And right now you're kind of homeschooling. I am, yes. Right now I'm working. I'm a full-time, you know, I'm a worker here. So I don't help them full-time at church. So mm -hmm. I do. And, and, and you're teaching what kind of children? Oh, teaching? children with disabilities. Oh, isn't that awesome? Wow. No, oh, no wonder you two are so sweet, so compassionate, you know, and giving. That is so awesome. And also now as being um, uh, pastoring along kind of with your husband, you're over the women's ministry. And how was that gathering, you know, women? Because, you know, we come into church with so many different, you know, ailments, spiritually, you know, emotionally broken and tie them in. So you, what, is there anything specific that you've learned or that you do that helps you found that you have personally found helps to unify the women as they come into the church to help kind of integrate them into, you know, with other women? Because I think that's one of sometimes one of the hardest things is, you know, when women come in to, because we come in with trust issues and different things. We know we want help, but, you know, can I trust, you know, who can I trust? How do you work to sometimes bring that about? I don't think I ever felt like I had an issue to bring the women together. I mean, the women are, are great and just helping one another and just talking to one another. You know, when we go to events, we, we help each other just to decorate and bring food together. It's always a unity in the women. So I, I always felt that way. And even when we've gone to conference, it's never been a problem. We went to the conference, ladies, sign up, sign up. I take 20 ladies to leave the conference. I feel like it's been a blessing to work with the women's That's awesome. And I think though, I think that that can be a lot of that can be con, uh, attributed to you in a sense, how your spirit and how you present yourself to the women. Because um, as Pastor Pablo, as you had said, your wife is not one that talks a lot. She does a lot, you know, she's a person of action and, you know, your work speak for you. And that helps the women when they look and see what you do. It's, it's like, oh, wow, she's real. She's really for us. You know, she's here to help us. She's not here just to sit in some glorified position. You know, um, she's here to roll up her sleeves and work and seeing that, all that you all do. That indeed is who she is. Uh, my wife doesn't speak much, but her face does. Right. You got to see it. Her face, I mean, people in the church, that's what she's known. If you were to survey any of the women in the ministry and any of the men or anybody in the, in the, in the church, they say all you have to do is look at her and you'll see if she's happy. You'll see if she doesn't like something. Sometimes, I think she learned that with her, you know, uh, her skills from teaching, you know, because she'll look at you. 
you know, even if you can't <laughs> hear her, you know, um, she's just, her demeanor is just one of no joke, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, but one of the wonderful attributes of her, the many wonderful attributes of her is that um, I don't recall a time where my wife was absent at anything that we do. If I do evangelism, she's there with me. Um, and, and that is, I preached um, on Mother's Day on five of the top uh, stay-at-home mom, but they weren't stay-at-home like, you know, I'm staying home and cooking clean. These were the ones that built their homes, right? And one of them was Priscilla uh, in the Bible. And why is Priscilla so known? Because she, every time you hear her name, she was next to her husband, Priscilla, and a killer. The killer. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is her. She, is the, she embodies the ministry of Priscilla. She is always by my side, even if she's not going to speak. I am talking about when I do state-of-the-city events, when I'm called to do speeches, when I'm called, she tells me, how she gets ready. You know, sometimes I'll be like, you come in, like, all right, you know, but for the most part, I don't got a bag. I mean, this, she, she, she just does it out of the heart. And the beautiful thing that you just said is that, and that's, that's, that's who she is, rolling up her sleeves. There's a ministry that cleans the church in our church. She wants to be there. She's like the one that I want to be because that's her ministry. She can claim. I'm telling you, she's a germaphobe. <laughs> and so, uh, so she wants to make sure that the church is spick and spick. So she runs with that committee. Aside from running with the women, she makes the calendars and with this disinfecting thing. Oh, that's her. That's her. That's her pet project. Oh my god! So thankful for that, and publicly want to acknowledge that. You know, I'm so grateful for the woman of God that she is. And you know, a lot of people say, "Well, you know, first lady, you no, know, she is not. She's not just a number. She's the lady." <laughs> All mind. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah praise the lord yeah yes i i like hearing that that's wonderful that is so awesome and you know uh, some of the things that i read about you um pastor pablo you are involved i mean you're not you all are not just in the church you're out way spend so much time outside you have you're in the community you've adopted the community you're you're, you've adopted schools. You're on um, all the different type of like you've been. A ch you were a chaplain for 16 years. You did chaplain. all these things that really affect the community, the people that you serve. And so it's not you know like you're interested in education for the. So you're you're in the school system. You're into you do police you know rides. You know going at night out into the city to be a representative. You know in the community, and they see you that you bring that force together, and that is so helpful when people know that they have someone who has a voice in different arenas that can speak for them. It says so much. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I've often heard it said before. I, I don't know if it was an illustration or don't know where I heard it, so I don't want to you know take take the credit from where I heard it, but. Um, it is a, is a sad day. It's a travesty if uh, our church were to burn down and people didn't know that it was there. Um, people need to know that our church is there. We're not a social club. Uh, we don't go there just to meet. And this is what this pandemic has exposed, that sometimes we were just going to go. But we don't need to be in a building to be effective and to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. He said, I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church has survived much more than quarantines and pandemics. So we're going to overcome this. So a lot of people say, pastor, even through this, I'm getting inboxes and emails. And it's just in my nature. And I, I give the glory to God, evangelist, but I don't know how to stay still. I don't know how to rest. Well, when I get to heaven, I will rest. <laughs> now, I will confess to you that I have burned out. For the first time ever, I did burn out last year. That's part of my my next book. I'll do that. I'll talk about that. All right. <laughs> so I've learned how to manage that. I'm managing that now. But the only way that I know how to live, maybe not her because she tells me, but I, <laughs> I have to be busy. Okay. I'm teaching a group of young people now in our church. This is my new thing. I've got about 10 to 12, right, uh, college and career kids that I'm taking them under my wings. It's, I just feel that I have to prepare the next generation. One of the simplest things that I teach them, you better get up by 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. CEOs do it. The, the most the, the most intelligent people they get up early, they're like, what? And they're doing it and they're the most productive in our church, right? They're 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 really getting it done. So, you know, I try okay. that on them and, and that's what I do. And I'm I'm up to, to the glory of God. I say all this, not to pat my own back or toot my own horn, 
but it's something that my pastor taught me, and mm -hmm. um, and it's worked. So, with all that being said, yes, I still work with the, the, the with the police department. Why? Because my mother and my dad raised me to hate cops, right? And uh, I understand on Romans 13, it says we ought to obey our laws and our yes. authorities. And once we came to the knowledge of Christ, you got to see my mom now, we, we, we bless them, we give them food. Every year we do a banquet for our police officers. Um, at the beginning, when I first started working with the police officers, it was a challenge because they're a different, just a different class of their own. They won't open up to everybody. But now I can say I have relationships with detectives, with sergeants, lieutenants, deputy chiefs. The, the, you know, the, the director of the police department, uh, and he's given us favor and uh, in, 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 in that platform. Then with the teachers, so at one time, the way I became involved with adopting our schools was that um, as a chaplain, I got called. It was a Thursday. They had canceled, like, school was snowing. And I got a call from our, our unit that they wanted me to respond because a, a young 13-year-old girl took her own life. So usually they call me when it's children, well, anybody, but for the most part, you, so they called me and when I got there, I saw the body. They were putting it in, in a bag. That messed me up. So you got to understand what police officers see, what I see, you know, on front lines, this is your topic of your show, yeah. uh, program on front lines, that could be traumatic for us. Exactly. Be right there. When I saw that, this was about four years ago, um, I was like, wow. That could have been my daughter. That could have been, you know, she took her own life with uh, prescription pills. You know, the opioids is attacking our inner cities and not just our inner cities anymore. Now mm -hmm. it's hitting you know, suburbia. So mm -hmm. it was a young white girl. Took her life. Um, we don't know if she took it or if she overdosed, but, it, you know, her life was prematurely, uh, sensibly taken, you know, sensibly uh, prematurely taken. So that day, her principal called me on the night. She said, I understand. I got your number from the councilman of the, of the city. He says you work with, you know, with the, with the chaplains and that you were there for the family because immediately we offered to help her with, with the funeral arrangements because they couldn't cover it. And we, we got some assistance so they can pay their light bill uh, right there. So, you know, Jesus would feed the, the, the need. He would meet the need before he could even get to the soul and to the conscience of people. So that's how we do it. And, um, so she was, she was taken by that, the principal. That was such a nice thing you guys did. Can you come, she said, tomorrow um, at 6 in the morning to the school? She goes, because it's a little early. And I said, okay, what would you like me to do? She goes, the teachers are distraught. This traumatized them that, you know, the young girl took her life. And we want to be prepared for the students when they come in at 7.30. So can you come in at 6? I said, okay. So when I go in there, I'm like, you know, I'm just going there to be ministry of presence. But this lady calls me and she goes, okay. Pastor Pablo is here. She had the whole faculty, a good 150 teachers, everybody that were there, cafeteria. She goes, all right, Pastor, they're all yours. Pray. And I'm like, that's what I came here for? And we prayed, we had a Bible study. And right there is the theme that you read earlier that I always say, the Lord touched me and said, you know what? Principals in schools need chaplains too, not only the police officers, because I serve them as their pastor. Um, you know, whenever they need a wedding or ch children's dedication, they want to be the community. <laughs> do pastoral care with cops um and it's something that you need for that you have to know their world and the lord told me now i'm taking you into the world of teachers and so wow. from there that was the first school that principal told two other principals in the, within the vicinity he's good he brings motivational speakers he's a motivator and from there they started calling me i adopt seven schools we buy kids uniforms there was a water issue in our city you probably heard of we bought pallets of water. We called companies so the children don't have to drink from the fountains. We bought them water. We do food pantries in the school. There's kids that they, they don't have clothes. I remember growing up where I didn't have clothes. They would make fun of me. I didn't have a haircut or whatever. So we get free haircuts to the kids, backpacks, right? We do it every year. Yeah. The backpacks, we bring our clown popcorn machines and all because of the generous givings of, my, of the wonderful church I pastor, Lighthouse Assembly of God. There, and, and, and you would think that we're a mega church, but you don't need to be a mega church uh, in order to do any of that. You need to have a heart of God. And that's why our motto is and our vision is that we love Christ, we serve people, people. but then touch, touch lives. lives. Yes. Yeah. And so every t now, mm -hmm. uh, the, the other day I ran into a big girl. You know, they, she was like, oh, pastor. We, we had ministered in her school years ago, and now she's on her way. She's graduating high school. She's a, she's a senior in high school. So... We're impacting generations to the glory of God. 
I, one time I complained as a pastor, where are all the college kids? I want them in my church. Now they're there. How about <laughs> We got to keep, you know, building and, 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 and planting seeds. So that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years, planting seeds. And so we, we adopt schools. Um, and then just, just this past year, we couldn't do the banquet for the police officers. So you probably seen what we did is that we, we took the food to them. We took Chick-fil-A to them. We took sandwiches to every precinct during this pandemic. We, we, we rented a float, a parade float. And we went around the whole city. Wow. And that's me. I want to make noise. I'm Puerto Rican. You know, you <laughs> I'm just, you know, I just like to make noise. And so, That's, let everybody know you're here. You're there. Yes. <laughs> that cool. is awesome. And, you know, that's what I mean about, like, sometimes, like, you know, we do, we give so much credit and, and credit is due to the medical, you know, workers. But when they're gone, the pastor has to always be there. You have to be there um, when a child is born. You have to be there if somebody loses a child, if someone is sick. You know, uh, when disasters and catastrophes happen, people reach out for the pastor because there's arms of flesh cannot bring what you bring. And so that's why I said that pastors really are the essential. And I'm glad you pointed out, too, that you don't have to be a mega church, yeah. you, you know, to do something. And it doesn't always have to be big and spectacular, but just one something. If you can, if your church can do one thing and do it faithfully, it has an impact. You know, and then the more things that you do, the more of an impact you can do at a time. For, for three years, I've always, when we moved into our new building, um, and we transitioned there, and I always wanted to give out groceries, you know, our pantry ministry, always. And, and you just reminded me, you got to be good at something. We are good at giving away food because we have a team that even through this pandemic, they have not stopped. I was, I was thinking like, okay, maybe, you know, we can't do this through this pandemic. My outreach coordinator calls, all right, Pastor, I've ordered the food. And I'm like, wow. And they've been, right? They've been more on top of me than I've been <laughs> on top of them. And uh, we, and it, it, you know, if you would, if you, you'll see a lot on our, on our social media because we don't do it. We're not the type of people that want to give so that we can put it on social media. Right. I understand. Yeah. Give the glory to God and to say they're still good in our community. And we were walking into the most troubling complex, uh, uh, you know, public, uh, complex in our city we went to three of them and it was raining and what marveled me this past weekend is that nobody complained in my group we were out there because i go with them i smell like sheep and we were mm -hmm. out there and there were people hanging out with no masks and they put your mask on they listen to me we go out there we, we, we went out last year last summer this is a testimony for the glory of god um the, the riverside court the grafton avenue there was a shootout there we were scheduled to bring uh, uh we do ministry with an ice cream truck mr softy so we, yeah, we bring Mr. Softy, because I'm from the Bronx. If you don't have Mr. Softy, you don't have a childhood, right? So <laughs> you know, he makes noise, and the kids, my mommy, the ice cream truck. So we bring it to them, because some of those kids are less fortunate. Their parents are hooked on crack and cocaine and alcohol and Hennessy, and they don't got to buy them a $3 cone. So we bring them the cone. Wow. And that's the ministry. We don't give out tracks. We give out cones. I understand. I know it's different. But when we went there, right, check this out. <laughs> the, 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 my, my secretary calls me. No, it, it was, uh, yeah, my associate minister. She called me. She said, we can't do this today. I said, why? We got the truck. Everything is ready. She goes, there, there's cases. There's, there's, a, there's cases of bullets on the floor. Um, you know, we can't come in here. There's a, there's a crime scene here. And I'm like, and they're, sa they're saying that nobody is allowed in or out. They just shot a little girl. Uh, 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 the, the bullet had grazed her in the knee. In the knee, seven year old, I think it was, and I'm like, oh, we're not. We ordered everything, we were ready to go, and the Holy Spirit said, "You're going." I said, "Oh, my people are going to be scared. They're not going to want to go in there. Who? Want, I didn't want to go in there." Yeah. <laughs> you know? The Holy Spirit said, "Go," and you know, and I'm from New York. I didn't, we ain't <laughs> so I called. This is why you need these connections. I called the chief. I said, Chief. You know, the shootout, the, yeah, no, Pastor, we thank you. We know that you were scheduled to go to that complex. Stay off the path, uh, uh, Chief. Can, can you still let us go in? Just keep the cops there. Just let us go in. We want to bring that ministry of presence. They're traumatized. A kid just got shot, Chief. He said, all right, I'll keep my cops there, whatever. Long and behold, I didn't know this. The truck comes. The, even the ice cream truck guy was scared. He was like, what in the world? Because the tape was still up. They let us go in. Wow. They for us, and they let us go in with the truck. 
and we went in with our army of people with our shirts that said lighthouse and we were just saying how much we love them and they were like looking at us you can see the faces of trauma right they were stunned because it was just like 30 minutes that didn't go by there was you could still smell the gunpowder it was it, and i'm like and guess who was there to witness it all the news reporters all the news reporters were there um and they they saw how within that 30 minute span ice cream changed the counter of the kids they were all smiling you would never everything the t they started running around everything got back to normal because god's people showed up with ice cream with ice cream and you we have the pictures they were smiling that is the ministry and then the news people they were like tell us how did you do this we were just here everybody was scared and and the mom and we even seen that i think the, the relatives of the young lady shot just ice cream. They were like, oh, thank you. This is so nice. We appreciate And we were giving our groceries that day too. Grocery, ice cream, and water. And they weren't fighting for it. They're not animals. Wow. You know, they're, they're just underprivileged. You know, they just need an opportunity. And Absolutely. So that's what, and here she was, right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, going with you in the valley of the shadow that you were going with. Them, that is so awesome. I tell you. That's why the Lord is is with you and blessing you so. And you know, for my for the viewers, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the viewers a little. Um, I want them to see a clip of your ministry uh, during the pandemic. So uh, viewers, don't go away. We're just gonna give you let you see some of uh, how Pastor Pablo was serving uh, and is serving during the pandemic. We'll be right back. Now this seems like a nightmare to everybody. It seems like I can't wait to get back home. And it's only been like, what, 14 days, a whole, almost two weeks. And so uh, what's our plan when we get back to normal? You know, I heard someone say, uh, I read an article or maybe it was a, 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 a post that somebody posted on social media. And they said, they said, I will never take anything for granted after this quarantine is over. Check that out. I guess this quarantine made them think a little, huh? Isn't, isn't that the same way when we put children on timeout? You go stand in that corner and you think about what you've done. <laughs> I think this person, when they posted that, it, it resonated with me because they, it, 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 caused them to, to, it caused them to reflect. They said, I would never go back to the way it used to be. I will never take life for granted after this quarantine is done. And you know what? I co-signed that. I sympathize with that person who posts that. I too would never go back to the way it used to be. I can't. I can't go back to the way it used to be before this quarantine. I really can't. Could you imagine how slaves felt in captivity? I'm talking about people who were enslaved for 400 years, people who went through issues. How did they feel when they were enslaved? What would you think they would dream at the time? Could you imagine them picking cotton or working the farm or working for the slave owner saying, you know what, when we get out of this slavery, when we get out of this, I'm going to buy me a house. Do you imagine if they, 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 they thought uh, low of themselves or they thought impoverished, when I get out of here, I'm just going to stay the same. Or when I get out of this slavery, uh, I'm not going to do nothing with my life. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most slaves said, when and if I get rid of these shackles, when I get out of this, I promise you I'm going to buy me a house. 
I promise you I'm going to live better. I promise you no one would ever whip me around again. And isn't that the case? When we're enslaved, when we're going through things, it's what I said last week in our sermon. I said we ought to hate sin. We ought to hate what is evil. We need to say when I get done with these shackles, when I get done with the way I'm living, I'm never going back to the way it used to be. Come on, somebody. Well, I hope you enjoyed that clip of Pastor Pablo uh, serving during the pandemic. That's just a small uh, part of what he really has done and is doing. And you're going to see um, so much more because I'm going to put the contact information um, for Lighthouse Assembly of God Church and all that they're doing. So in case you want to contact them, you know how to reach them and you'll be blessed. Um, but Pastor Pablo, one thing I want to ask you before we wrap up too, is that after the pandemic now, when the state is opened up, what are your plans? Because your church, you have been ahead of the curve. Technically, you were already on there. You were doing things. Uh, you weren't getting ready. You were already ready and already doing it. You know, you were online. You were on social media. The, the, the people of your church um, were used to being ministered to, you know, in that way, um, besides just having Sunday services. So it wasn't new for them. It was, it was just ongoing. It was natural. So really, I don't, asking you how things are going to change when you go back, you're already prepared and in the change. But is there anything that you see, um, things that differently, like more or what you want to do going back as yeah, coming yeah. through this pandemic? Yeah, so that's something that for several weeks now, I've been fasting and praying about because one of the things that I think is a touching point for every minister that is watching or listening is that we don't want to go back to the same routine. Um, and, and if you're, you know, and I, and I thank you and I give God glory for all the nice things you're saying, but if you think that we were doing something before, I don't want to do that. I want to take it out to, to another level. And, uh, but I also want to, uh, everybody listening to me today at the sound of my voice to know that I care about the, um, the lives. More important than the offering, than the building, than anything else is the uh, lives of the folks. So I have, I know I have people that are nervous to come back out. There's a fear. And we can preach the fear is not of God. That's another day. We can talk about that. But there's a reality that we have to walk in wisdom. Um, and so, uh, again, I think that one of the things that I'm going to be looking at is that we are going to shorten our services for sure. Um, we, we will probably, that, that's going to have to, that's going to be harder on me than anybody else. Cause I love to talk and preach, uh, but I've already been learning, right? I've been, I've been doing good online. Yeah. I, you know, so, um, so we're, we're going to change that. That's going to change for sure. So, but we're going to be more, uh, effective in the community. We're probably going to be doing more outside than inside, uh, probably into the winter. So I'm going to be honest, and this is probably the first time on your show is going to be said, is I, I, I'm coming back probably, we're going to open up the doors probably either by Father's Day or after. Um, and I know that we're in a hot spot, but um, it's going to be different. And mm -hmm. we're going to probably have 25% capacity. We're going to use a lot of, a lot of uh, precaution, sanitation, sanitation mm -hmm. stations, sanitizing stations, um, We've already got a plan in place that I presented to the governor's office and to the mayor's office, a whole packet, an eight-page booklet that I gave a promise, promising booklet that what we promised to do. Um, you know, I'm going to go get tested to make sure. Uh, so uh, I just want to lead by example. Um, so I'm going to get tested this week. Uh, I also will have the temperature station or the thermometer, the electric one. When people walk in, we're going to change the distancing of the seats. So it's going to be a little different for a while. Yes. Uh, you, know, our, you know, our church is uh, Pentecostal. We, we, we love to shake, dance, speak tongues, all that. Someday we, yes. Sunday. we like that. But, um, you know, the Lord is still going to move, but I, only, I, I will only limit the services to probably 45 minutes, 10-minute worship, you know, five-minute mm -hmm. announcement, and then preaching, and we're out. Um, yes probably into the fall and then from there wherever the lord leads us so that's how we're looking i already have that plan um i've been planning that now for five to six weeks i'm praying 
And so, you know, we have a preliminary date, hopefully by, you know, I don't want to disobey anybody, but that's the plan. We have a booklet already. The, the mayor personally spoke to me and received it, um, you know, and, and he said he loves it. And actually, um, we've given it to other churches to use. So we just want to be ahead of the curve in that area. So we're ready. Amen. That is awesome. That is really awesome. Well, it has just been such a pleasure speaking to you and Erica today. And I thank you all for your time and your willingness to share today. I know it's going to be a tremendous blessing. And, you know, I, I thought of you and when thinking about doing this particular uh, segment on pastors, I was reading it. The verse came, that thought came to me when I was reading in Acts the 20. It's chapter in the 28th verse where it says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so many pastors like yourself do make many, many sacrifices, you know, and just like you have a wife and you have children you know, you all make a, a tremendous sacrifice because like you said, you try to lead by example. And that's really putting yourself out there ahead of everybody else, you know? And so when things, when the attacks come, who do you think they attack first? <laughs> you know, is the leader, the shepherd, you know, and people just don't understand, you know, um, how essential you are. And it's not just the physical attacks. It's the mental and emotional. People go home and go to sleep. You go home. You don't have to take just your children and your wife. You take the membership with you, you know, what they're going through, all that while you're trying to sleep. That's going through the pastor's mind and in his heart. He's taking all that with him. And so it's definitely essential worker. And pastors are just, you know, God's gift, I tell you. So I, I thank God. Thank you for your service. Praise the Lord. Amen. For your service. Erica, thank you for your service because as he served, you've been right there with him, right alongside of him. And I know it's just such a blessing to the church. And um, I hope that, you know, we can just continue to have like ongoing, you know, fellowship and uh, I can do uh, some yearly reports and where you're going, you know, what the Lord is doing through you because I think that's just such a blessing. We need, it's encouraging. And it really is. When my book comes out, I promise to be get you a copy right away, and we could do a review on that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. That's a guarantee. Let me be one of the first to get you on here. <laughs> I would love. I would love that. I love. I love your spirit. I. I could just you. You made uh, being interviewed very easy today, right? It was. Yeah. It was smooth. <laughs> It's time. You do a great job. Thank you. Oh, listen. It's my pleasure because I love it, and it's a part of serving. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so I'm just so happy that I can do that because um, so many times pastors are not highlighted in the way that they should be. People don't see all things. And sometimes it takes somebody who's been there to understand. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just so grateful. And to the viewers on the Well After Hours, thank you for being with us. And remember, we look for you every Thursday, 7.30 p.m., Facebook page, Beverly D. Allen, YouTube channel, Beverly Dallin Ministries, LLC. Come on and hang around the well with us. We got a lot going on and we've got great persons that we interview on all different topics. So, you know, we'll look for you again next week. So please come back and don't forget to like, subscribe, and put in a little heart <laughs> when you can. And we appreciate you. God bless you. And God bless you. Pastor Pablo and Erica, we thank you so much again. Thank you.